Hello, everybody, and welcome to Atheist Sunday School, your one-stop shop for everything Atheist Sunday and school. And boy, do we have a show for you today. Today, we are covering Jeremiah chapters 1 through 3 with Landon Knoll. Yes, Landon is here. How welcome. are you, Landon? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone, latitude, and legal status of your uh, state's voting records. <laughs> Yes. Wow, that's a lot of dependence this time. Yeah, yeah. There's got to be in such in such a oh yeah, <laughs> in such difficult times. Well, welcome back to the show. Thank you, thank you, and and behold, we have a show for you. See. Ah, yes, and Lennon is wearing one of our classic behold shirts. Yes, which you can get on Teespring. Yeah, you can get it on Teespring. Uh, and you know what? Actually, since today is the first Sunday of the month. I, and I, you know, it's my bad for what? for getting to set it up before the show. You, dude, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're going to make dick. me do this right now? <laughs> Completely forget to oh set it up. Oh, my gosh. But that's why I'm talking oh, so much, to give you time. I'm trying. Uh, so, yeah, we, we got the team. That's why this is such a professional show. You know, everything's <laughs> well choreographed and, and, and planned and uh, so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, we have the, the T-shirt giveaway today. And you know what? If you want to be included in these monthly T-shirt giveaways you could become a patron of ten dollars or more in addition the winner of this t-shirt contest will be the winner of the saint nicholas day t-shirt contest because today is saint nicholas day happy saint nicholas Ooh. day everyone wow i would never have guessed seriously yep. <laughs> well actually the fifth and sixth and like maybe 13th depending on hey, which tradition I got it. follow I'm all ready. All, Saint all right. Day. Yeah, so. I mean, the Orthodox, the Orthodox Church is sort of chronologically challenged or, or <laughs> they, they, they have things with calendars and, and, and problems. I mean, they have problems with facts based upon stuff. But, but you know, that's, that, that's nothing new. Hey, Landon, um, are you ready to see if you want a shirt? <laughs> yeah, let's find out. Let's spin, spin that, that wheel. wheel. Wow, so many people. To possibly, uh, yeah. Either way, it's a uh, it's one or the other. Yeah, but, this year has you know it was said it was Landon just barely. It oh, was Landon. Landon. Oh, you get a oh, shirt. Oh, that means I have to commission yeah. another shirt. Yeah. Don't I? <laughs> well, we can uh, we can get working time. on yeah. that Amalekite Lives Matter shirt. I, I was thinking of the Awkward the ostrich the, thing. The oh, the, there's that one. But I was thinking more of the the Drive Six Six Six. You know how there's like Route Sixty Six. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. like one Drive of those. 66. Yeah. yeah, that would be a, a an automotive uh, twist to the uh, beast. Oh, and if we have that graphic, we can throw it up when we talk about the six 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 drives on the stream. Oh yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. We could uh, we could throw that up there. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I'd have to get that commissioned. Anyways, um, we have all these books. I have the King James version of the Bible. Uh, well, I have the English Standard version. It's it's right here off to the side for now because I have so many books. We also have the Robert Alter translation and commentary of the Hebrew Bible. Yes, and yes, we the do. Holy Scriptures according to some Jews and the New King James version of the Bible. Now introduce all these. Yes. All right. So we got a. Uh, wow. Since we're starting a new book today, we got a lot of stuff going on. This 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 small mountain of books. Uh, so yeah, of course we have Erdman's. We have now we have two books from uh, the Hermenia commentary series. Uh, they are both of these are on Jeremiah, you know, parts one and two, uh, and they are both from William Holiday. And Holiday is not spelled the way one would spell Holiday. It's Holiday. Yeah, yeah. And here's the book. I don't know how well it's showing up on the green screen. Probably, uh, yeah, so so. All right. Well, either way. Uh, that's, that's part one. Part two is right here. And part two actually has the more in-depth, uh, introduction. So we'll uh, be referring to that shortly. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go over that and then I'll switch over to the other one. Uh, we also have the new interpreters Bible. It's, it, you, I know you can't see it and I'm not going to go through the effort to move this just to put it back. Uh, but it's right here. <laughs> the, uh, the is well. This isn't the commentary. It's the survey, the Old Testament survey from the New Interpreter's Bible. So, uh, that's that's what else we have mm -hmm. uh, going on. So quite yeah. a quite a lot. You know, I was thinking maybe we should get some of those little sands. You know, the thing that looks like a little easel that mm. holds out that you can put the book up on too. I, I think I have those, dude. My yeah. mom was an artist. You know, yeah. those would be pretty nice. So you just that have to we find don't them. Have this <laughs> Good luck. Mountain. 
Yeah, yeah. We, we still right. we would have a different kind of mountain. Instead, it would be like uh, <laughs> like I'm I'm sectioned off well, from I mean, like the rest of reality. One is it's more referenceable. Like you don't have to like. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to do and that. And also, like, then the audience would be able to see the covers yeah. a little bit. So sure, mm. as well. So. So, but since since you ask, I will be reading from the New American Standard Bible, a reference edition by A.G. Holman Company, uh, copyright God or somebody. <laughs> somebody. Uh, it is, it is, the book is copyrighted. Um, and 1973 is the last time it was copyrighted. So I guess God has been at the copyright office re, re, renewing <laughs> his uh, or her. Or it. Yeah, I don't know what. Does it have like cover art? Or anything? Uh, well, it it does have a uh, it's in, it's in a it's in basic in a a, a letter bound mm. thingy oh. thing from when I was a kid, and those things mattered. Um, it was given to me by my uh, brother, who uh, wanted me to wear the inside out rather than the outside in, so he <laughs> gave a protective cover. Um, he since he's since uh uh. uh improved his uh his outlook on life and doesn't doesn't hold to such things but 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 by the way and by the way thank you uh jason um uh, hopefully we have a good uh, audience here because i believe we have some beholds uh coming up oh, oh excellent. you know classic it's, it's, gotta love those beholds don't you i don't know yes i i do i love them if they were if they were real people i would uh I would propose to them because I love the behold wow, so much. That's crazy, man. I, I believe you. Thank you. I believe that you're that attached to them. Uh, <laughs> we, we have multiple shirts about them. So, yeah. I, so I, I hope that people in the chat do the proper behold thing. And pray. maybe maybe someone could do the B and the hold symbol uh, since I can't do it. At the moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, Maybe someday, Landon. Sunday. Someday. You know, Sunday. you know, you may may as well have to, you know, put all that uh, you two drawn behind you and just, just come back, suck it up uh, and come back. I'll, I'll give it due consideration. Oh, okay, yeah, you better. That due <laughs> consideration. So tell us about this book. Yeah. Tell us about this book we're about to to read. So what's, what's, we what's, are we are going back to the days of Josiah's reforms. You remember those, don't you? Oh, oh yeah, I remember them during the two kingdoms period, right? It's Josiah. Isn't well, Josiah was the la the the last really good uh, king. Yeah, right? he he was the one that uh, you know threw all the idols away, and he was uh, changing. The, they found the scroll, right, which is did, probably part of Deuteronomy. Yeah, yeah. And did yeah. they did they throw him in the river that time? Uh, was that one of the river times? The the, the Kidron River. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Did did they take down the high places too? Uh, yeah, that oh, time, nice. that time they did. That was important. That always was contingent on like success. Yeah, that, oh, that, 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 so we're going back to those times. Yeah, nothing to do with bullfrogs, nothing to do with three dog night. <sighs> Sadly. And the, the thing is, you know, if we started talking about bullfrogs, we might get a, a copyright strike or something. You know, Jeremiah. Stop. <laughs> is a book in the Bible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't agree more. All right, so, so that's so uh, Jeremiah. yeah. So Jeremiah is you know obviously very important prophet. Um, so in the in, in the same vein as other prophets like Isaiah, uh, the the book itself has had plenty of redaction. There have been different versions, and we've tried to you know um, make sense of the changes that exist between those versions, and there's. A really long commentary on just the version types, because um, there there are multiple. Um, you know, before the show, we were talking about a little bit. Uh, there's more than just the the Masoretic and the Septuagint. Um, there's also stuff from the Peshitta. There's uh, the st uh, stuff that we have from it in the Talmud. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of it, and they all have a. And there's the Vulgate one, obviously. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot that we could. Uh, discuss when it comes to the history of this book, but just as Isaiah, this book has also underwent transformation, um, as is expected. Now, I think that the 
if we can say that there is a historical Jeremiah, then the then the man himself would have probably been a contemporary of um, some of the other prophets uh, that we have, um, at least, you know, supposedly their sayings or writings preserved, uh, like uh, Nahum, I think. Mm-hmm. He would have been a contemporary with him from the reading that I have done. And, you know, let's be fair here. I haven't, like, read every piece of Jeremiah scholarship. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's the longest book in the Bible by Hebrew word count. So, so surely it attracts a lot of Ooh, commentary. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's so happy about the <laughs> longest book. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, the fact that we are getting through it now means we won't have to do it later. But of course. That, Silver lining. <laughs> so, so in, in the various you know, people that have you know, Bibles, um, why is... Why is Jeremiah in the position it is in the book? How, what? Oh, uh, so the, the history of canon studies is, I mean, it's, it's weird. They section these things off by, you know, they have, you know, wisdom stuff. They have wisdom literature in one space. They have, uh, you know, obviously the law, the Torah Mm -hmm. next to, Mm -hmm. you know, all all that is close to each other. Right. But Uh, the Jews have it differently than the Christians, right? Uh, Like the Jews have the Tanakh, right? Which has the writings, the Torah and the prophets as different sections. But those sections aren't presented in the same way in Christian presentations. Yeah. Not in the same way. It is a, it is a little bit different. Um, like some of them are chunked together, mm-hmm. but it is it is a little bit different. I I don't know why it, it changed that much. Manuscript but, differences. It wouldn't even really be a manuscript difference. It's just like an order of, uh, it's just the order of things. You know, I imagine once upon a time, a lot of these books, scrolls, right? And they, I mean, you wouldn't have them all in order on one scroll. Right. Uh, sometimes the the confusion may, may arise from canon lists, for example. Like if somebody, if an, if a church father says, you know, here is the list of books that we have, and they write it like in a different order, like then maybe later copyists would, you know, write the the books down in that order. It's like maybe he just forgot the order that it was in, or maybe he just wasn't even considering the order that it was in. So... Um, well, within the liturgy, um, at least, I don't know about Christians, but Jews read through the Torah in a particular order, right? And it's like part of their religious practice when they're in their temple or their synagogues or whatever you want to yeah, call yeah. it, right? Um, and so, like, the ordering may have relevance to different uh, religious communities. Um, it may, that's true. So I'm sure that different um, priests or rabbis at different points in different areas would present books in an order that seemed to suit their community or their viewpoint more. Well, in the ancient world, it would have been less about uh, less about reading these things themselves and more about having these things read to them. Uh, sometimes manuscript, the manuscript traditions do change based on the liturgy. Uh, for example, a really good example of this actually is the pericope adultery in, uh, in John, you know, the woman taken in adultery, that whole thing. Um, we have manuscripts that uh, have it in different places in John. Uh, we have manuscripts where it's actually in Luke. So um, it, it, you know, hops around from place to place, and that probably boils down to the liturgy. Yeah. Um, so it, you know, some of it may go down to that. But does that play into Jeremiah? Uh, I don't know. I guess we'll see. And uh, is Jeremiah, like, sectioned off in the same way that Isaiah is? Not exactly? not in the same way, but it is uh, It is a little bit similar. Like, the, the later chapters of Jeremiah. I'm going to go into this a little bit here. So, uh, from a form... Okay, so from a critical point of view, the book offers daunting problems and uncertainties. Establishment of a dependable text is a difficulty, as is well known. The Greek version, the Septuagint, and he just refers to it as G, which I don't know why you why you wouldn't refer to it as LXX, like 
every other commentary, but okay, man. Because it's in Greek. Uh, d- yes. R- ridiculous. Anyways. Um, so the Septuagint here and after G differs markedly from the traditional Hebrew text, the Masoretic text here and after M. Uh, the oracles against foreign nations, chapters 46 through 51, as a group are to be found in G after 25:13, and they're in an altogether, uh, yeah, and they're in an altogether different sequence from that in the Masoretic. And more generally, in the prose passages of the book, uh, the text of the Greek often does not exhibit phrases and sequences present in the Masoretic. Most of these omissions are short, but a few are extensive, the longest being 33, 14 through 26. The question then arises regarding the textual history of the book and what text can be used as the basis for literary analysis and exegetical work. Um, so the author uses G for Septuagint and M for... For Masoretic text. Yes. Uh, wouldn't they be better off using G and H? Um, they would be better off using just LXX yeah. and MT. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's just, if that's like the standardized, yeah, like he explained it, sure. But well, like. Maybe they reference these things so often that it would actually be like. It would too cause them. Costly. It would cause them carpal tunnel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is the, the sad state of scholarship. So, yeah. so, so in general, the, what are the themes that we're going to be seeing in this book of Jeremiah? What's oh, the general? see, I, it's hard to give you a generalized uh, uh, thing the about the themes. <laughs> so, this, uh, so the commentary that I have been reading through, in fact, all of them pretty much, uh, so, well, some of them don't discuss themes that much really uh this one does discuss themes but it is so disordered that i cannot actually tell you uh broadly what the themes are Uh, i can go over um a few of them so aside from you know all the all the textual stuff which i'm sure i'm positive actually that the that the more in-depth commentary does go into you know verse by verse and stuff um it does have plenty of writings on the uh like identification of each scroll so more you know textual tradition stuff uh and then themes uh let's see there's jeremiah's uh dependence on hosea there's uh jeremiah's dependence on amos there's jeremiah's uh yeah uh how he is reminded of events during the kingship of David and Solomon. Uh, There is possible parallels in Joshua and Judges, Jeremiah's remembrance of Moses and to material in Exodus. Um, There's a new covenant and, uh, you know, some stuff about the sieges, obviously. Uh, The Jerusalem conference and its consequences. There's another one. Um, So... Yeah, but it's a very long book, and so there's going to be a wide range of themes covered. Too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if if I remember from when I used to, to study the Bible, you know, I talked about that there's a whole, you know, there's a lot of the covenant keeps coming up. Oh yeah, and then Jeremiah has these sort of prophetical confessions or whatever you 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 call it, and then there's all these sort of acts or gestures where he was a there's a bunch of 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 prophet things out, out in out in public of 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 things that 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 occur um and that's kind of seems to be this of course is is, is the whole thing about you know focusing on on the um essentially the the, the fall of of uh of Judah and all that sort of of, of stuff the the babylonian yeah the the that stuff would have became incredibly important after the exile, especially, yeah, yeah. so which the, is it's it's been you know the running theme throughout the Bible, yeah. So the Jeremiah character and everything, uh, this takes place before the exile. I'm assuming most of it. Be- so the because he's his life is like within the range of this last uh, Josiah, right? So uh, Josiah had come to the throne of Judah in 640 BCE when a child of 
eight years, the second king is 22, one. Uh, yeah, so when he was a when he was that small. Mm-hmm. Um, Judah had been a vassal of Assyria for decades, but by yeah. roughly 630, the hold of Assyria on the west was beginning to weaken. And in 627 or 626, Ashurbanipal died. Sometime during those years, Josiah began withholding tribute from Assyria with impunity. At the same time, given the inability of Assyria to maintain control over the old northern kingdom of Israel, Josiah made attempts to exert his authority over that area. It is in the year 627 that I placed the birth of Jeremiah. Uh, So around like 40 years old or so, Jeremiah would witness the Babylonian invasion, right? Uh, around, yeah, or maybe in his uh, because in his thirties. Sort of like when when Babylon defeated Egypt, mm. right? That made basically Judah part of its own territory. Yeah. So this character Jeremiah is kind of a contemporary of Isaiah, not exactly. Yeah. He yeah. takes he's he lives a little earlier than Isaiah, right? In yeah, the I'd story. say so. So. It's odd that they place him after Isaiah. <laughs> well, it, yeah, either way. <laughs> I mean, this this thing isn't really chronological, let's face it. Right. Um, but, it's, they wouldn't but, be that nice. <laughs> but again, the, the big thing is that, they, that, that, that once Babylon basically def, you know, destroyed Assyria and defeated Egypt, um, they, they then basically ended uh, Judah's sort of independence you know, minded stuff. And uh, you know, and and essentially, the the, the so called the Babylonian exile, as it's, it's called, um, comes during this this particular period. So uh, Jeremiah, I think, spends I think spends time basically saying naughty, naughty, naughty Jews, uh, <laughs> bad Judah, um, and does a bunch of 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 public gestures and his own. I I I get the feeling when I read this that that Jeremiah would be one of those people, you know, flogging himself. You know, raw and that sort of stuff. Oh, really not not of, too far off. <laughs> well, you know, probably, you know, probably more, some, more some emotionally. Some, you, know, the, you know, the 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 crazy the crazy dude down in the park that 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 does all that sort of stuff. Well, so uh, I guess uh, in this case, he's not considered crazy. He's considered divine. So right. Well, you uh, the person holds. you gotta keep in mind that this character will have. Um, a very diverse range of experiences, right? Because he's operating under the rule of Josiah, oh, who's a very righteous king. And later in life, mm-hmm. he also experiences the Babylonian invasion and exile, which are pretty much polar opposites of each other when it comes to the story. Not only that, but you could say, you know, when he was growing up, he still might have had a good amount of influence from people who weren't, you know, very happy about Josiah's reforms. Right. Yeah. So that could very well play into it uh, as well. So this so. guy like witnesses the decline and destruction of the state. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're going to empathize right. with him quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We know exactly what that's oh, like. Oh, right. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, so, so, Last so days of Rome. We here. have three, three chapters, I guess, the beginning and, and uh, we got the, uh, the first chapter, which just says Jeremiah's call and commission. Yeah, what, one of the one of the things that I wanted to uh, point out, you know, since we were on the Josiah thing, anyways. Uh, so this is on Jeremiah being a propagandist <gasps> for oh. for Josiah. Um, as I've already indicated, Deuteronomy would have been rejected again in the autumn of six fifteen by uh, my reckoning, Jeremiah would have been 12 years old. With hesitation, I suggest the possibility that this was the occasion for his responding to his call. Uh, Verses 7 and 9 are very similar to Deuteronomy 18.18, the word to Moses about a prophet like Moses in time to come. Uh, Is this not a likely occasion? Jeremiah himself protests that he is only a youth, Uh, I have elsewhere proposed that Jeremiah's perception of his call was shaped by traditions regarding Moses and Samuel. As for Samuel, there 
is the tradition, doubtless known to Jeremiah, of Yahweh speaking to the boy Samuel. And you know, plenty of references um, where uh, the, the, they refer to him as a boy, Samuel. Uh, and one may recall that Jesus is recorded as discussing matters with the teachers in the temple when he was 12 years old. Uh, yeah, makes sense. Uh, in any so, event... So, like, wisdom from a child. All right. There was even a king. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, Joash, I think. Yeah, right? Joash. I think it was Joash. Yeah. He was, like, nine or something. Yeah, and he was, like, raised in the temple. Yeah. And hidden away. But, like, uh, wisdom from a very early age is very common in mythological uh, figures. Right, so like you have a lot of stories about the birth of gods or holy figures, where like literally as babies they're talking and walking around and like providing wisdom to people. Sure, yeah, Th- it does uh, pop up uh, a lot. Very common motif. Yeah, but as I say, isn't there a sort of parallel between sort of the Jeremiah story and Moses story in terms of 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 uh, being this sort of you know youth called and and. Being in being in exile, but then rallying something is a. I mean, there there are certainly parallels. Uh, so the the difficulty in scholarship is to figure out what is actually connected to what, uh, because you can have a parallel, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a historical link between them. Uh, so yeah. the difficulty is kind of getting through uh, that. Uh, yeah, trying to get out of the weeds, I guess. Sure. Um, so as we uh, read, we will, you know, as we always do, we will form our own opinions on these things. But we will always have uh, this scholarship for reference. And this is, uh, this book has some exciting things in it and it has some not so exciting things in it. Uh, so I cannot wait to be done with the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, you know, we're almost, we're a little over halfway through. Yeah, yeah, we're getting I mean, there. Like 60%, I think. So you're going to have to wait, Lawrence. Ah, uh, yeah. darn it. <laughs> uh, so is, is that all for introduction? I think, you know. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's all for introduction. Well, Let except me... for the ESV has its, uh, oh, that's its right. introductory paragraph. Yes, right. yes, it does. Uh, oh, boy, so many commentaries. I just had to switch out the, the Hermenia one for uh, part one, I suppose. See, folks, what, what is this quality scholarship here? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this is, you know, because the ESV has these paragraphs at the beginning of every single book. I got to read these out. Uh, all right. Not an excessively long one this time. No, no, not too long at all. Jeremiah, often called the weeping prophet because of his sorrow over the persistent message of God's judgment, prophesied to the nation of Judah from the reign of King Josiah in 627 B.C. until sometime after the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 He dictated his prophecies to a scribe named Baruch, which, of course, is there's another book all on its own. Yes. Um, Jeremiah's task as a prophet was to declare the coming judgment of God. However, throughout the book, we also see God's concern for repentance and righteousness in individuals as well as nations. This dual focus is seen as God's instructions to Jeremiah. He was to pluck up and to break down, but also to build and to plant. Jeremiah sees a future when God will write his law on human hearts and they shall all know me and I will remember their sin no more. All right. Yeah, there's that. Baruch. And, I think people are still waiting. And, 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 and. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What? Uh-oh. Uh, that's Lennon not good. Is frozen. Oh, no. What happened? Well, yeah, that's a. Uh, let us. Uh, that's a bummer. Well, I, I suppose we will. Uh, Your computer's still going, clearly. Just. Okay. uh Keep going on with what we're doing then. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. 
All right. Um, don't know what happened there. Uh, hopefully, you know, I'll, I'll message him, let him know what uh, what happened. And oh, he's back. Oh, okay. Hey, Landon, you just freeze. Yeah, you just froze yeah, you, there. You just froze for a bit. Uh, yeah, you were like in about to ask a question or say something, and uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, adamantly crashed. Ah, well, anyway, I was just saying that that I think I was I was basically you know saying that 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 you know the question would be you know is 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 Jeremiah's message written on our hearts or are we just uh, defying that? So. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, but you know what? I know plenty of people who would say that it's already written on our hearts, and we're just. Uh, we already know God exists. We're just rejecting it, right? Oh yeah, we're it's, just suppressing it's in it. There with all the plaque in the arteries. Oh man, I love that plaque yes. in my arteries. Oh, yeah. I would marry it if I could. <laughs> oh, God, you gotta stop. You gotta stop doing that. You're gonna marry so many horrible things. Hey man, <laughs> polygamy, I guess. Oh, ah, polygamy. Yep. I'd marry it if I could. Uh, I'm sure you would. Hey, <laughs> the concept. Look, don't you have uh, the Old Testament survey? I do have the Old Testament survey. Uh, However, there's really nothing very useful in it. Nothing we haven't already discussed. All right. Um, Well, it has a map, doesn't it? It uh, it does. It does show the audience. I'll show the audience the map. Tell them what the map is. Uh, All right. Uh, The map is the Fertile Crescent. At the turn of the seventh and yeah, the turn of the seventh, sixth centuries BCE. Uh don't know how well you can uh you can see that, but there is the map. Um I'm pretty sure it'd be hard to to tell things apart on it though. Yeah. Oh, it's great. But if you're familiar with the area <laughs> at all. Yeah, you you might know what you're looking at. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, then why don't I hop into this from the KJV? As we've been talking about Jeremiah for 32 minutes. Classic. Anyways. And also we should uh, change the the chapter and uh, invert. Yeah, that 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 says Isaiah 67. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, is that? Yeah, it needs to say Jeremiah 1. Oh, how do I do that? (laughs) J-E-R, I assume. I I would think it's J-E-R. It is J-E-R, but. uh. It's (laughs) Jeremiah. Yeah. Full, all caps. I'm almost positive that's how those are the first three letters of uh, of Jeremiah. Well, we have, Chris and I were discussing about Star Trek the other day, whether Star Trek Discovery is D-I-S mm-hmm. or S-T-D. <laughs> that's pretty good. Isn't it? Yeah. I think it's S-T-D. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, why don't I hop into the KJV here? Uh, the book of Jeremiah, chapter one. So this opens a lot like Can't Ecclesiastes. It just be chapter 67. Come on, no. guys. No. No. Uh, so this opens a lot like Ecclesiastes. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. So Anathoth. Yeah, I am uh, trying to find my way through, yeah. through all this. So um, Anathoth has Thoth in it. I assume it's not about Thoth. Uh, I would not think so. Uh, so this is a village near Jerusalem, although Jeremiah is identified as a, as a member of the priestly caste there. What follows does not indicate that he was an officiant in the temple. Mm. All right. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So, I'm glad we talked about all the dating before I read that verse. Yeah. <laughs> because I would not be able to place it as well based off what I just read. Yeah, and uh, there is not much... Uh not much commentary, honestly, on all this. I mean, if you've read the book, you kind of know around the time period that you're looking at. But if and you haven't read the book, then you have no idea. Well, we, we went over it already, right. so you, you still have a general idea. Yeah. Go 
back and watch that one part again. Uh, they make it more confusing by introducing Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. They could have just said in the 13th year of the reign of Judah, uh, of Josiah, rather. So the immediate purpose of the superscription is clearly to set the material concerning Jeremiah in time and space. But theologically, it affirms that the words and deeds come from Yahweh to this particular man at a specific time in history. Yeah, so it just establishes him as a prophet. All right. And it establishes the time and place. Yeah. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Oh, that's interesting. That... Uh, that it doesn't say behold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, it's interesting because they have this set up. They're like, these are the words of Jeremiah, right? Um, and then they go on introducing the time and place, which obviously aren't the words of Jeremiah. They're just about the words of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. right? And now we jump into it here in verse 4. Um, but there's no quotation marks or anything to denote that in the KJV. So it kind of vague. Oh, uh, well, that's a bummer. Yeah. It, it's there. <laughs> yeah. It's also strange because here in verse four, um, this is obviously Jeremiah when he says the word of the Lord came unto me. Yeah. Saying, and then the next verse, they're saying what the Lord is saying. Yes. <laughs> so these I statements are no longer about Jeremiah that we're about to get into. Uh, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure you've heard that verse uh, quoted uh, quite a lot, or at least part of it, right? Mm. You know, before... Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I knew you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then said I, this is now Jeremiah again. Yep. Ah, Lord God. <laughs> Behold! 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 There it is. There is the beautiful Behold shirt, as you behold, can see. Behold, behold. It's holding a B. Are Thank you, you going to behold, Brother. too? Oh, yeah, sure. Behold. Oh, <laughs> uh, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And we lost Landon's video. Oof. But no, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm taking on turning off the the videos to help deal with the bandwidth. Ah, uh, okay. makes sense. But the We're Lord, yeah, you know, when you're reading, for sure, put the video back on. So. Um, but the Lord said unto me, "Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak." Well, that's a uh, Reason to say that you're not a child? <laughs> I, well, it's more like he's just saying, shut well, up and do what I tell you to do, right? Well, uh, I think it's it's more about like... Uh, okay, so do not say, I am only a youth, for to all whom I send you, you shall go. Okay, so... Uh, it, he he is uh, smarter than he thinks he is, I'm guessing, because mm -hmm. of the help of the Lord. But he's functionally saying, no, no don't say that because you're going to do what I tell you to do. So he's essentially just telling him to shut up. Uh, Yes, he is. He is saying that. You're right. right. Uh, but I think it's more about, uh, you know, <laughs> God's almightiness and oh, you know, okay. whatnot, having his help and, and stuff. All right. Uh, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Has this happened to any other characters? Uh, that's verse 9? Sort of. Yeah, that is verse 9. Uh, I, I'm halfway through the verse, but let me finish the verse. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto me, Behold! 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 Hey, Landon. Behold. <laughs> Thank you. you. Uh, I have put my words in thy mouth. Yeah, so there is uh, there is some a good amount of commentary on this. So word and action are still intertwined. Yahweh said to me is matched by Yahweh extended his hand and touched my mouth. 
uh, the action is similar to that in Isaiah's call. There, the seraph took a live coal in his hand with tongs and touched Isaiah's mouth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there I it is. I remember that. That's what that... I meant by sort of. I kind of remember something weird, yeah. yeah. Yeah, now in Isaiah, that was like a purification thing. Yeah, in both instances, the prophet's mouth is reading, is, sorry, is readied for taking in and giving out Yahweh's word. And the action of touching Jeremiah's mouth is linked to the word of explanation. Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Mm. Uh, it would be... Okay, so he... he does include some textual notes here uh, for the Hebrew. So it's not like I can read it. Um, oh. <laughs> so, uh, but apparently apparently the word uh, for my word uh, is singular rather than my words plural. Uh, this reading would bring the expression into congruence with that in verse 12, which is clearly singular. Uh, but the Greek, Vulgate, and Talmud are all plural and the word in uh, the Peshitta, which, uh, you know, at the time of writing this, it wasn't, uh, the commentary on it wasn't published. I don't know if it is now. Mm-hmm. But this was written a while ago, I think. So I, I sure hope it is. Uh, and the word in the Peshitta carries the uh, plural sign. So there is no warrant for the change. Right. So, I mean, that's of theological importance, though, because the word of God is like its own separate yeah so discussion. it could be my word or just my words which because is yeah because the word yeah is like the ability to create light and do crazy shit like that right uh, right it, I, I would say that there's a, a, a much stronger theological importance for the word because then you get into the whole jesus stuff mm-hmm. because jesus is the logos right yeah, like there's right. magic and then there's like god you know there's a big difference mm-hmm. right uh, theoretically, in this book, can- theory, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me continue then. C. I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down to build and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said. I see a rod of an almond tree. Uh, so the rod of an almond tree. Almonds represent fertility yeah. usually. And yeah. So what's up? Because I see, they're a nut. Right? I see an There's almond seed. branch. Uh, so there is some uh, commentary here. The word may be used of a walking stick mm. uh, and the sort of staff used in divination. Here it means the twig of a tree. Presumably in bloom. How do they use a stick in divination? I mean, I understand like casting lots, but those aren't like a walking stick. Uh, uh it could. I think there was um, I remember an Egyptian thing on this. Uh, because I know that some Hebrew mystics would do the thing where they like cover their head with a sheet, mm-hmm. and they like you know do their chants until they have visions or whatever. Um, but. Like, I'm not familiar with a mode of divination from any, like, occult system that I've ever read about that uses a stick from an almond tree unless it's, like, making runes or something to cast out of that stick, right? Oh, let's read on. Uh, I mean, I think it would it, it would be, I think it's close to, you know, casting lots. Mm. But uh, I don't know if they're looking for direction or... Or maybe they like color one side or something and see which side lands up. Yeah, um, they're trying something new. It could be like a yes no thing. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but yeah, the direction thing could be it. Like, but then you have to determine a top and a bottom too. Yeah. So. Uh, it's either story. way. Uh, there is a little bit more commentary here. There is no doubt that the word is related to the verb watch in verse 12. So the word association in the two verses is that of a true etymology, not a folk etymology or simple wordplay. It was noted in ancient times that the almond was the first to bloom in the spring. Thus Pliny so states, uh, specifying that the almond blooms in January. One may further cite uh, Ahikar 2 7, uh, which I think is a, I think that's a Talmudic tractate or something. 
I'm guessing. That's just a guess. I could mm-hmm. be very wrong. Um, my son be not in hurry like the almond tree whose blossom is the first to appear, but whose fruit is the last to be eaten, but be equal and sensible like the mulberry tree whose blossom is the last to appear, but whose fruit is the first to be eaten. Uh, the present writer will never forget the experience of seeing the white blossoms of almond trees in early February. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, through a thick morning fog. Fu- wow, he's just adding stuff to it. Um, uh, the almond thus it's, it's watches. It's just such a magical experience. Yeah, yeah. He breaks into poetry. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is... This is... You would never forget seeing these trees, Lawrence. This is Holiday yeah. saying this. Yeah, Th- this this isn't like him quoting something. That was holiday <laughs> That's just saying. Super flowery wow. writing, man. Right, incredible. Uh, that was beautiful. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you for that prose. <laughs> uh, this the suggestion has been made that the narrative of Aaron's rod, which spouted ripe almonds, mm. uh, may have played a role in Jeremiah's vision. But this is unlikely. The emphasis in the vision is not on twig or rod, but on almond, and the association. Of that word with watch. Uh, I can see the Aaron uh, comparison because he's already of a priestly lineage. Right, yeah. Uh, so, and he's just been given a position of power by Yahweh. Mm-hmm. So, like, taking on the role of Aaron kind of is a th- inappropriate thing. Yeah. Um. Now, where was I? The rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me. Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Now, is this a divination? (coughs) So, uh, the seething pot here, uh, this is a cooking pot, uh, describing a large one. Though such a pot might be of earthenware, it could well be of metal, either iron or copper. Uh, the modifier uh, is a it's okay. It's a a passive participle of a blower fan. Uh, the related noun. Oh, there's a very close one in six twenty nine. It uh, bellows. A uh, similar phrase is found in Job forty one twelve with a synonymous noun and the same modifier. Out of a crocodile's nostrils comes forth smoke like a fan pot and rushes. Uh, let's see, I am trying... Okay, so the first occurrence of uh, face refers to the surface of the rim of the pot. The word is often <laughs> used... <laughs> yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, yeah, so um, the, the word there's is, a long philosophical tradition of arguing about holes oh, and yeah. the definition of a hole and like the properties of the objects that's borders constitute a hole if that's mm-hmm. what a hole means and that's uh that's what that reminds me of yeah, is that not topology or <laughs> i guess you might be able to say it is, but it's more of a metaphysics issue. Sure, I could see it as both, actually, because it's like, oh, well, this isn't a hole. It doesn't go all the way through. I blame it on linguistic <laughs> confusion. They, uh, sure. Yeah, Don't you I'm always? Like, oh, hey, we've got, we've got to the mathematician Landon yeah. Noll with an opinion. <laughs> what do you got to say yeah, on that? Landon, what does math tell us about what a hole is? Oh no. Oh no. Oh, no. It happened oh, again. No. Uh, <laughs> he was just about to answer the most important question of all time. He was about to blow my mind, but oh, oh now we lost the video from oh, him. He did that, I think. Oh. That makes sense. Either way, we'll we'll know when he's back. I will I gotta come I got I'm gonna come back and re- reset something, so Okay, so okay. good. Please continue. Okay. Landon will return momentarily. With the answer to life's greatest questions. Yes, it's not forty two. Oh, damn it. It's it 47. Might, might be 48. You're close. 96. 12. Hut. Oh, hut. Windows 97. Hike. Wow. Yep. Uh, um, so I'm going to continue a little bit about okay. this, this this pot and its face into the north. Yeah, so um, I'm going to read the next verse because it's relevant. Okay. Uh, so the face of the pot is towards the north. Then the Lord said unto me, 
out of the north, and evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. So I'm assuming what is meant here is that he's communing with God, and his method of divination is to like have a pot of boiling water or something, like a boiling stew. And the vapor or the smoke that comes, the direction that it wafts in is like relevant to his divination method here. Uh, so <clears throat> there is a, a good amount of commentary on this, and this is, you know, part of the confusion for, you know, the textual tradition of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the probable assumption about the pot, uh, and if, if you recall the, the reference in, um, in Job, Mm -hmm. You know, kind of drawing back to that. Uh, the probable assumption of the Job passage is that a pot is filled with water and steaming, though if rushes is correct, the assumption is not a necessary one. That pot, like the one here, if the present proposal is correct, may be empty of water. Uh, in any event, the word bellows by itself does not imply that water is involved. Um, the Greek text in the present passage translates the participle with uh, with a fire under it. Yeah, it's just so weird because none... Well, the, it, it continues it, here. It continues. I, the universal assumption of commentators, however, is that the pot is filled with water, that it is tipped, and that the water is about to boil out toward the south. Uh, this assumption is natural given the present form of the text in which the tribes of the north are to come down to invade and judge Jerusalem. But, and that's in verse 16, but if the phrases of verse 16 are viewed as a reinterpretation at the time of Karshemesh, uh, then the necessity of visualizing a pot filled with water falls away. That there is no water in the pot becomes likely when one encounters the following phrase, and its rim is away from the north. Because it has always been assumed that there is water in the pot, it is further assumed that the pot is tipped, doubtless only slightly. But no one in his or her right mind places a pot in a tipped position before filling it with water to boil. Uh, no one wants to... No one wants the water to spill when it boils. And in any event, the vibration of boiling water is liable to tip the pot all the way over. Quote, its rim is away from the north suggests a quite striking sight that the pot is lying completely on its side or empty. Away from the north? I mean, the KJV says the face thereof is toward the north. Well, it and it continues on into talking about the face. Uh, so yeah, the first occurrence of face refers to the surface or rim of the pot. The word is often used of the surface of water, like in Genesis 1-2, uh, and once of the surface of a dish that is wiped and then turned on its face, right, that is the, upside down. But the plain surface of water doesn't point in any of the cardinal directions. Or you, you know? could say it's up. It's that's up. Just, yeah. That's not north. Though. I know. I know. You could just say it's up. That's about it. Yeah. Um, so that is, a, that is a tough one. Thus, the efforts of earlier commentators to translate it front... Uh, explaining it as the side facing the spectator is simply wrong. A pot has no front or back. Uh, the second occurrence of the word... What's up with this weird philosophy? I don't know. Means, uh, But it means away from. Uh, the form of north with the locale is, uh, normal, is normal idiom. One concludes then that the pot is lying on its side with coals underneath it that are being fanned. The situation is precisely that of Ezekiel 24.11. The empty pot is being heated in order to get rid of baked on food remains or other uh, carbonaceous material. Oh, so this is a cleaning method. Yeah, in the manner of, of modern self-cleaning oven. Mm. Uh, so that would give it more context, right? Yeah, the, Because then when he says out of the north and evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land, that's uh, like, you know, the baked remains of the foods are crumbling away and it, there's like some symbolism there, right? Whereas if it's just like a pot 
Uh, it's just strange. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It is. It is definitely strange. Um, the passage in Ezekiel mentions both filthiness, a word which welcome is, back, Landon. Ah, hey, buddy. We're talking about uh, filth and pots. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Yeah. We were filth. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna uh, get through this uh, discussion. It's it's almost uh, over here. Uh, the passage in Ezekiel mentions both filthiness, a word which <laughs> is in his metaphor has cultic associations. Of course, makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, ritual purity, all that stuff. And the New King James uh, Version says boiling pot. Yeah, uh, boiling pot is also... Facing away from the north. Ah, okay. So, you know, there seem to be textual problems. Yeah, there's a... Yeah, <laughs> a good amount of them. Uh, can't, uh, can't really be overlooked. So the process in question would get rid of organic material, but not rust. But the uh, word that's usually translated as rust... Uh, is a cognate with a Semitic word for dirt, so that Ezekiel uh, may not have used the word in our sense of an oxide of the metal, of course. Mm. Uh, in any event, the situation described in Ezekiel 24.11 makes uh, explicable the fact that the pot is empty. So, Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it makes more sense if you think of it as a cleaning method. They're purging organic material... Just like the Babylonians are going to purge the organic material from Jerusalem. Would you like to hear what Alter has to say about this? Oh, what does Alter have to say? So uh, it is turned to the north, or more literally, it is facing the north. This wording has puzzled interpreters because a pot has no front. And yeah, got that. Perhaps the least strained suggestion is Yer Hoffman's. The pot is sitting over a fire in a three-sided hearth with the open side facing north. Uh, and then from the north shall the evil be broached. The ominous nature of this prediction is enhanced by the vagueness of the formulation. The enemy is the later 6th century BCE, uh, in the later 6th century BCE, would have to be Babylonia, which is definitely more to the east than to the north, though perhaps a northern invasion route is envisaged. The destroyer from the north also invokes the dire memory of Assyria, uh, which a century earlier descended from the north and annihilated the kingdom of jerusalem uh yeah because you you could interpret this just to be you know um so consider it this way so israelites Mm -hmm. at this point you know the the northern region would not have been so uh so god-fearing right uh you know the the god-fearing people in the time of josiah was uh you know the Judah in, in in Jerusalem. That's where they were. Yeah. Um, so it, I mean, we'll, you know, talk about it more, but it also might be a reference to that. I'm sure with more context, we'll have. All right. Let's get more into it. Then. Uh, for lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come and they shall set. Every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. Now this is confusing. Um, they talk about the walls around uh, Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Presumably, which uh, would have been okay before the before before right. the invasion. Yeah, they made a point of talking about the construction of the walls after the return from the exile. Yeah, I don't recall them making a point about the construction of the walls of Jerusalem prior to that. Did they? I think they did. Yeah, like yeah. initially, maybe. If, when know, did wasn't... they initially talk about Jerusalem uh, and the building of Jerusalem? Uh, I think that was back in uh, it was back in Kings. I think, yeah, maybe even before that. Mm. All right, it, it just seems strange because they made such a big deal about the walls after the exile. I swear they've come down and then be re- rebuilt at least once. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I guess. And Sweet. 
I'm glad I'm right. <laughs> I will utter my judgments against them touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Yeah, uh, as the next clause makes clear, them refers to the Judites, uh, not to the yeah. invading kings. Mm -hmm. So they're referring uh, to the high places or just, just in general all throughout the land? Well, you know, they're they're worshipers of uh, other gods. Ashura, yeah, and Baal, and a couple other different kinds distinctly are brought any up. Kind, there could be any kind, yeah. Yeah, any kind of idolatry would be included here. Yep. And, uh, like... Which was a big, was a big problem. Yeah. That was like the the whole um, yeah even the like, main crux of the reforms. Now that continually comes up in other prophets' works. So like in Isaiah, that came up a bunch of times is the idolatry. Yeah. Um. And Isaiah's argument against it was basically that they can't do anything. Yeah. Right. I uh, mean, that was pretty much the argument against it beforehand. Uh, so perhaps we'll run into more of that kind of um, speech. Yeah. In Jeremiah. Anyways, uh, thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, 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 behold. I have made thee this day a defensed city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. So like a lot Except of... The Lord is not with them because the Lord is pissed off. and so yeah. Right, and it's also like the suffering servant who came up in Isaiah, and that they get, like, rejected when they deliver yeah. their message. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. Maybe that plays into why they placed it this way. Uh, perhaps. Uh, so these verses are... If, first of all, I just want to point out here that there is a whole discussion in here on the problem of the identity of the foe to the north. So, you know, we're not the only ones talking about that. Uh so these verses, 17 through 19, are genuine to Jeremiah, but were added late in his career. Uh, they are a word from Yahweh of encouragement to, to Jeremiah. Uh, the opening pronoun, for your part, is balanced by for my part at the beginning of verse 18 in the second line. Uh, yeah, uh, not by... I in the second line of verse 17, which is evidence of textual confusion. Thanks, Jason. Uh, First Kings has Solomon making walls around Jerusalem. Yeah. So that answers the question. So uh, there were walls. Yeah, of course there were. Uh, so Jeremiah is told to gird up his loins. This phrase denotes tying a belt or the like around one's waist so as to confine the tunic or other long garment or to tuck up the uh, extremities yeah, of one's tunic to the belt. Like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. <laughs> oh, yeah, classic. Yeah. Got, gotta yeah. love that one. Tuck it up and, uh, and uh, you know, get ready. Uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, a modern ex expression with similar connotation is roll up your sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta roll up your sleeves yeah. and put Boot. some elbow grease into uh, it. <laughs> pick yourself up by those bootstraps. Yeah. That's the one that no one uses anymore. But that is the end of chapter one of Jeremiah. And do you hear something mysterious out there? Yeah, we did a whole 30-minute introduction. Uh, yeah, a yes, a I hear something. Yeah. Now, this is very unusual. Behold, I am your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to let all you heathens and sinners know that I support this wonderful episode of Atheist Sunday School. Lawrence and Reuben try their very best to bring you the true glory of the Bible, and they need your help. They have provided links to their Patreon page and other social media just for you. Once again, my name is Jesus Christ, 
and this is Milwaukee Atheists. The Lord is with them. God bless. I hear you. Uh, we're back. Uh, Ooh. Yes, yes, we are. Um, thank you, Jesus, uh, for, for taking Reuben. Yes, thank you, Jesus, for taking Reuben. Reuben. Sick of that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Better get out of here. <laughs> yeah, he was real, really getting in the way of this whole reading thing. You know, we we wanted to read, but we couldn't because Ruben was just here doing nothing the uh, whole time. Yeah, right. Yeah. Come on. He, he's going to have to read here when he gets back. <laughs> No, it's. I think it's your. No, turn. it's me. It's my turn. Yeah. Uh, but I am going to start handing him over all the, all the commentaries, uh, and whatnot. So before we hop into this, uh, this next section, at least in the commentary, is uh, two one through four four. So it's broken up in uh, strange ways. Uh, so the present state. Of uh, yeah, he talks about the. Yeah, this is really split up in a very strange way. So, uh, the rubrics he's calling them two, one through three, and four, three through four. Uh, so there are four rubrics within the material, uh, and he splits that up even more. Uh, it is conceivable that there are secondary interpretations of the words that follow glosses subsequently added. Uh, this is the assumption of some commentators on. Uh, 312 we're not going to be uh, getting to that one just yet uh, so it is split up in a lot of strange ways I am honestly trying to help you out Ruben and find the uh, find where the actual commentary <laughs> on the verses that we need begins well because uh, it's not uh, not easy yeah. I bet it's in so there so so my my section says that this talk about the people's apostasy is this section coming up. Yeah, yeah. As you, as we all know, the apostasy was a was a big deal. That was the you know whole issue with the high places and and whatnot. Okay, I think uh, I think I found it. Here you go. <laughs> there it is. That's where it starts. The the rest are like uh, I'm not saying they're they're not important. We just don't have the time to cover it all. But there are sections on the on, on the units basically how they divide up the units okay um well uh we didn't really use no we did not Yardman's no. for that chapter we but, did not. you know i'm sure unless you want to say something about uh chapter two well the thing is that in Yardman's chapter two Verse 1 is lumped in through chapter 4, verse 2. Yeah. Instead of just being a chapter by chapter play. So let me just yeah, so I'm sure. say a little something about this. Um, sexual politics and a marital narrative trope make up the prophet's expose of Israelite Judean religious polity. The call narrative's anticipation of inescapable national doom is laconic with respect to the indictment of national sins, supplying doom's rationale. With this marital expose, the composition remedies that lack. The composition narrates a root metaphor. It tells the history of a... Failed marriage as a national religious parable. Husband and wife, a friend of the groom, and the children of the marriage are stand-ins for Yahweh and Israel, the prophet, Jerusalem citizenry, and exilic survivors. The religious sins of the nation are read under the sign of a tale of sexual morality from the perspective of the cuckolded husband. <laughs> Holy shit, really? That's the name? Straight e, out? Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Yep. Thanks, Bible. Under the perspective well, of the cuck. Sermons. Actually, there's a dash. It says cuck dash olded husband olded. Uh, because it goes oh, to wow. the next line. So it really says the perspective of the cuck on the line. <laughs> um, 
Historical exile is linked to its metaphorical equivalent, divorce. The failure and shame of Israel are subsumed under erotic female dangers, with dreams of restoration the prerogative of male dictates. Yeah, so uh, we, I'm sure everyone remembers that psalm that has the marriage scene, right? Yes, and of course the uh, song. Yeah, so Song of Solomon, yeah. which uh, I would say is not, not, uh, not that, but you know, it has it's, been interpreted that way before. It's something like that. It's so it's one of these things of, of, of blame the female, I, I think, theme we see in the in the Bible, going again and again and again. <laughs> So as is tradition. Yep. <laughs> it's not like this is a sexist book or anything. <laughs> sad, sad but true. All right. Uh, so you know that's why everything is split up the way it is because the next uh, couple chapters here are all part of the same metaphor. Yeah. So there's a bit that I can get into, but I'm going to do it. After you read verse three. So okay. why don't you read one through three? All right. So chapter two, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord. So uh, first off, uh, the Lord hears Yahweh. Okay. So that's who we're talking about. Of course. Uh, I remember the devotion of your youth your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. So when it says, I remember, this is Zakarti Lach, I think. Uh, carries several nuances which are expected for the modern reader. First, the verb is perfect. The imperfect is used when study or permanent memory is intended. But the perfect of this verb appears to emphasize a particular past action with the present consequences. I have recalled and so now remember. Compare Hosea 7 2. Second, the act of remembering is the act of calling to mind an image from the past which assists in determining action or influencing action. Yeah, like uh, he remembered Israel and all that stuff. Yes, the act of remembrance is not simply in a reflection, but involves an action and encounter with historical events. In J.R.M.'s... That's, that's Jeremiah, that's how he... Oh, uh, yeah. okay. That's like the, the root um, Jeremiah, because when you talk about Jeremiah, it could be about the book... Or when you talk about Jeremiah, it could be about okay. the the compo like the composite author, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then you could talk about the root Jeremiah, okay, the, the, like the historical person. So yes. there's you know lots of different divisions. So in Jeremiah's diction, the verb carries the nuance of give attention to something. So the present phrase suggests, "I have put my attention to the loyalty of your youth." The expression in your favors, uh, literally for you, that's lach disregarded incidentally in Greek suggests with the verb a forensic nuance compare Leviticus 2645 the phrase refers to a legal situation of the defendant far from being an expression of Yahweh's idle uh, recollection then the phrase describes Yahweh's laying the image of the covenantal solidarity of the past alongside the covenantal rupture of the present implying the necessity of taking action to rectify the rupture the noun chesed, here loyalty, is central to the Old Testament theology. Uh, this can also be steadfast love, right? The present discussion... Deals Actually, who, who was it that kept uh, arguing about the definition of chesed? I remember that we were reading a commentary. I'm fairly certain it came up a lot during uh, Psalms. Yeah, I think it... Ah, oh, man... I don't remember. Yeah, I, think, I think you're right. It was Psalms. Well, it's it. Yeah, I think it was Psalms, but I'm trying to remember the author that was consistently talking about its meaning. Oh wait, was it um, who was that guy that was it Sarna? Mm. It may have been. I don't think it was Sarna though. No, I remember it was Witherington. 
Ben Witherington the third, I think that was his name. His uh his book on Psalms. Uh yeah, I think he was the one that kept uh talking about the definition of Hesed. Yeah, there's a lot about definitions here, so sure. I, I wanna go through it really quickly. But uh first Alter says the kindness of your youth as elsewhere, the Hebrew Chesed is equally implying loyalty in a relationship. Uh the bridal love has Israel as the bride. Um Later, this provided a warrant for the allegorical reading of the Song of Songs, Song of Solomon. Yeah, there you go. Right. Uh, you're coming after me in the wilderness. And the interlinear parallelism between this line and the preceding one, we were given a concretization of the bride Israel's loyalty and love. She did not hesitate to follow after her divine husband, even in the forbidding landscapes of the Sinai Desert. And w- with Israel being holy to the Lord, this is something that gets a lot of attention in both of these commentaries, um, and there's also some in Eerdmans I want to talk about. Uh, the Holy to the Lord, Alter says this suggests something like dedicated or the special possession of. Now, here in um, Holiday's commentary, Holiday says Israel is identified as Kodesh to Yahweh. Um, the normal translation for the line Israel was holy to Yahweh is somewhat misleading, for Kadesh is a noun, not an adjective. And further, holy suggests moral purity, a nuance not central to the passage. Both Kadesh and its parallel first fruits, Reshit, are words drawn from the cult, and this is surprising, the pre-exilic prophets did not ordinarily use cultic language to define Yahweh, uh, Israel's calling. The well, noun... I, I would say that purity is kind of important in context here. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know what he's going on about there then. Because well, I, I would say it is important. I would say it's central. Well, he says the noun Kodesh refers to what's within Yahweh's sphere, particularly his cultic sphere. Oh, okay. Priests who are disobedient fail to make a distinction between what's appropriate to Yahweh, Kodesh, and what is fit only for ordinary use, common, profane. Uh, that's Chol. Ezekiel twenty two twenty six. I mean, I would still say there was stuff going on, right? Because if you talk about the, um, you, you know, there were some kings who were passing their kids to the fire, right? Mm-hmm. And that would have been Gehenna, uh, the, the, the valley. Um, and you, know, you have to remember the, uh, the recency, the freshness of the, the bull statues, because you, you had one at uh, Dan and one at Bethel. Uh, and those those were uh, priests. They weren't Levitical priests, uh, but they also had priests there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I understand this is a, a different... Because um, if, t- if they're talking about Israel as a whole, then uh, that would make sense. Because, you know, all who... Eight of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them. That would have been, you know, their guilt, uh, their um, their sins against the Lord. Well, they want to imply that disasters are a consequence of sinning against the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that regularly shows up, which is uh, fitting for the time period because they're talking about the, like, first, second Kings era, mm-hmm. which was a lot of that. It was, like... Uh, this king does what's not favorable to the Lord, and bad things happen. And this king yeah. does what's good to the Lord. So this would be something that would be on a character's mind yeah, absolutely. at this point in time. Um, also, Eerdmans says, As it stands, reference to the wilderness sojourn evokes Exodus election traditions and imagines that earlier period in Israel's existence to be one of idyllic cult fidelity and purity. The relationship. Let's let's just forget about, uh, you know, the the golden calf, and let's forget right. about, you know, Moses killing half the people. Let's just forget <laughs> about that. Forget about that. That that doesn't matter. Uh, the relationship between the patron deity and the national cult is characterized in harmonious terms. The proper Yahwistic devotion on the part of the community enjoying a special protective status of the divine husband or patron. Already, the composition creates a world that founds national existence and security that is the freedom from poaching appropriate to sacral national status holy 
first fruits, uh, within a matrix of cultic purity and fidelity. But the Masoretic text has subtly introduced the reference to the wilderness sojourn into its performance of the tradition at the same time that it more explicitly draws in the implicit audience from the margins of the dramatic scene. The Septuagint has for to to be only how you followed me, oracle of Yahweh. Masoretic text, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Oh, okay. Yeah. And instead of the laconic uh, Septuagint in 2a, and he said, the Masoretic text expands, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, go and announce in the hearing of Jerusalem saying. Uh, the Masoretic text is clearly intent on parsing the marital metaphor in political terms. It does so in advance of the oracle by concretizing its historical occasion and dr the dramatic audience Within the oracle, it does the same by referring to a period of the marriage to a national myth, uh, allegorizing the marriage and the cult history of the nation as parallel. So that's the relevant factors that's going on in this introductory like poem that appears. And this is separated out as like a different poem in Alter. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob. And all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? Of course, that uh, the belly all right. Mm. Yeah, um, I think that's uh, probably the word that's that being was used in there. verse five. Yeah, it says. Thus saith the Lord, what wrong did your fathers find in me that they grew distant from me and went after mere breath and turned into mere breath? Oh, uh, or maybe that's the whole vanity yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hevel, the term reiterated in Koholet, yeah, is here a pejorative epithet for foreign gods. And when you were describing Jeremiah, I was thinking that that sounded similar to Koholet. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, they did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through, where no man dwells. Yeah, so on the noun, uh, Salmavet, utter darkness, uh, okay. There is a large literature. Given the Arabic Zalima, be dark, and cognates in Ethiopic and Akkadian, critical scholarship has assumed recently that the traditional understanding of the expression Sal Mavet, shadow of death, so already, uh, is a folk etymology, and that the true form is Salmot or Sal. Moot. But recently, given compound nouns in Ugaritic, particularly those with ill, there has been a swing to the view that the traditional interpretation is correct. Compare supreme darkness, which is. I love supreme darkness. Yeah. Ma. Pelia. Speaking of uh, supremes, I could really go for a crunch wrap right about now. Ooh, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, yeah, that was uh, kind of interesting, right? And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. Yeah, the formulation disc, reflects... Disc, disc, yeah, disc. right? <laughs> right. Uh, it reflects an understanding that the land belongs to God. Yeah. Right. Uh. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Yeah. So that do not profit. This is wow. very different in altar. Okay. Altar says the priests did not say, where's the Lord? And those skilled in teaching did not know me. 
And the shepherds oh. rebelled against me, and the prophets prophesied for Baal and went after it. They came out of it. Uh, so the, yeah. the closest I can think of is uh, Proverbs, you know, with teaching and law being so close. Mm-hmm. The shepherds is a fixed epithet for rulers. Um, what cannot avail is an epithet for the non-entity of pagan gods. And for those skilled in teaching, uh, the literal sense is those who hold on to the teaching. Ah, the, okay. the verb is used for anyone adept at a particular profession or skill. Gotcha. Uh, therefore, I still contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your children's children I will contend. Uh, so, contends with the Lord, I'm pretty sure... Was that... That's, who, who's, that's, uh, whose name was that? I contend... For the Lord. That was in Judges. Was that Samson? No, that was was it Gideon? Maybe it was Gideon. No, oh, the dude who struggles with the Lord is... Um, no, no, that's something else. Oh, that's something uh, else. Uh, uh, Joseph? No, 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 no. Con- yeah, contends, that, that's what I was thinking. Contends for the Lord or contends... Uh, what verse is this? Oh, man. Uh, verse 9. I remember this popping up in Judges. Verse... Nine. Yeah, and I, I remember when I was doing, you know what? No, when I was doing my golden calf video, I well, remember there's, this there's coming up in the reading. There's reference in, in Ezekiel there, but but Ezekiel twenty thirty five thirty six. Okay, so I, really I don't know. Wrong. I guess we'll see if someone in the chat can uh, can refresh my memory on that. But yeah, I do remember it being. Contend, I mean, the contend. There's there's certainly a references, I guess, in Ezekiel as well. But but we haven't gotten that yet. So two nine here. Um, there's legal phrasing here. Uh, therefore, that is why. Yeah. It's a judgment thing. Um, by the proposal of the present study, this verse was originally part of Jeremiah's word to the north. Okay. Um, in that context, then the original confrontation of Yahweh with Israel was in 721, so there will be a fresh confrontation. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah made fresh use of the material to address the south. In that context, the original confrontation was with the north, and the fresh confrontation is with the south. There's a parallel between the first colon of verse 9, I shall enter suit with you, and the first colon of verse 7, and I brought you into a land of gardens. Um, Yahweh continues to take action with his hearers. If not in grace, then in judgment. It's not easy to find a good English equivalent for this word. Our words tend either to be too specific in their legal denotation or too general in to communicate the forensic context. It means argue out in public, particularly in the context of legal dispute. Hmm. Many translations use accuse for this passage, which is good if one understands it by a formal legal accusation. Yahweh is putting Israel on trial uh, for breaking the covenant, and it's not s- the hearers who must face Yahweh's lawsuit, uh, not simply the religious leaders named in verse 8. The leaders may set the pace in disobedience, but everyone is responsible to Yahweh. And he will continue the lawsuit to later generations until he gains satisfaction. So I guess like this contend with is really like an accusation. Like, yeah, that would that would make sense. I do remember this popping up in Judges though, or because uh, there there was this altar, right? Not Robert. No, no, not Robert. But the, uh, there was an altar, and then we had a a naming. Uh, yeah, maybe it was maybe it was Gideon. Ah, oh, man, I'm I'm looking back uh, on this, and I'm just kind of, uh, you know. Yeah, it could be, but yeah, either way. Why don't you continue? Yeah, I will. I will continue. We're not talking about judges here. Uh, for cross to the coasts of Cyprus and see, or send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed as gods, even though they are no gods? Okay, so yeah, I have this is the whole you're not worshiping actual gods. Right. They're, the, they're they are idols. 
It's an a fortiori argument. In new lands that are known from west to east, has a people switched gods even though the gods they worship aren't real? Yeah. <laughs> the is- Israel has exchanged its own god for a set of illusions. So, But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Back to the prophet stuff. Mm -hmm. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. Yeah, so Yahweh's address to the heavens begins with Shamayim Shomu. Be horrified, O heavens. Surely a parody of Isaiah's phrase, Shimu. Shamayim. Hear, O heavens. Also, Micah 1, 2, and 6, 1. The phrasing is effective not only in the wordplay and the fact that the emotional context of Shamu is extreme alongside Shamu, but also that in Jeremiah has postponed the address beyond the beginning of the accusation. The translation, be horrified, is an attempt to mimic here a bit. Um, so that's how they do it here. But the idea is roughly that it's uh, it's parodying Isaiah's phrase. Yeah, and also you you should be horrified that this uh, stuff is happening. Uh-huh. Uh, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. The fountain of of living waters and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So is this a... A cistern hewn in rock is a receptacle for the storage of water, perhaps rainwater, and not a water source or spring that continually flows. Its sides might be plastered, but would be subject to cracks and breaks through which the water could leak out. That's all it says, but... I assume you knew what a cistern is. No, I know what. Oh, I know what a fucking cistern is. I'm saying, is this a parallel to the the pot from before? Mm. <laughs> you I, went through that whole explanation that without letting me without thing. letting me finish my sentence. Well, it may be a parallel to the pot from before, but I don't think so. Is this is there pot and kettles and colors being talked about here? Well, there was a pot that was brought up in chapter one when you were having some technical difficulties, but um, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily related to this cistern. Okay. Uh, is Israel a slave? Is he a homeborn servant? Why then has he become a prey? The lions have roared against him. They have roared loudly. They have made his land a waste. His cities are in ruins without inhabitant. Moreover, the men of Memphis and uh, Tapanis, I don't know. So have, but the, these are Egyptian. Well, yes, Memphis so, is Egyptian. So um, I don't know Noth there. and Tapanis. Uh, these are prominent Egyptian cities. Okay. Jeremiah will follow his predecessor Isaiah in thinking that any alliance with Egypt will in the end prove disastrous. Even though in in Isaiah they did have that whole like, no, the nations won't fight against you anymore. You uh, well, yeah, yeah, very hopeful. Yeah, very hopeful. So, uh, so moreover, the men of Memphis and Tapanis have shaved the crown off your head. Have you not brought this upon yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? Shave the crown off your head. This just says, also, shall smash your plate. Oh. Um, let me see. I'm guessing another uh, Septuagint Masoretic. I'm thing. assuming. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, Memphis is, yeah, we talked about yeah, Memphis. Verse 16 there. Yeah. Okay. So there's a difficult verb. Uh, it could I be skull. Have, I also it have could be plate. It could be crown. Um, I also have grazed instead of shaved. Mm, also, it's sometimes alternative. used for head. Um, sometimes implies a king or a leader. So, so yeah, it's it's a pretty wide range of things that it could be. 
I mean, as is tradition, right? Yeah, I guess. Uh, uh, roughly, it means the top. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have you not brought this upon yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? And now, what do you gain by going to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? Or what do you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? So we can infer that this prophecy was cl- uh, proclaimed before the final destruction of Assyria in 612 BCE. Yeah, they would have been. Or shortly thereafter. Yeah, they, they wouldn't have you know necessarily been allies. Mm-hmm. Uh, they well, w- some they would have been... circles imagined that an alliance with Assyria could save them from the Babylonians. Right, right, which is why there was that whole thing in... Uh, in Isaiah about getting your horses from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. Keep going. Uh, Your evil will chastise you and your apostasy will reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord, your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. Yeah. And going. yeah, that now we're to the really trying to win friends and influence people here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. They're really on the side of the people. For long ago, I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree, you bowed down like a whore. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> scathing words here yeah you lean back a whore Dush. so altered notes about this uh the every high hill these are places for worshiping nature gods often uh, in they're fer- high places yeah. often in fertility rites yeah so mm. you might imagine what's going on in these fertility rites uh, yeah you lean back a whore Jack R. Lundbom is probably right in proposing that the verb suggests a sexual position. I, that is what it sounds like. The verse, it blends literal statements with a metaphor. Whoring is a recurrent metaphorical representation of idol worship, Israel's betrayal of her divine spouse. But literal sexual acts were performed in pagan rites in those bucolic settings. Mm. But we, we also know that like different... Fertility gods, like outside of like these desert traditions, like in the Greek uh, tradition, they would have like orgies. Yeah. yeah. So that was a thing that happened. It was part of their religion. Uh, and uh, to Jason in the chat, yeah, on, on contends, I, I think uh, with the uh, reference there to uh, Jeroboam, yeah, that's what I was thinking. He contends with Baal. I think that was a translation that I mm. that I saw. So that's that's probably what I was thinking of. Like Jeroboam. Tens with Boam. <laughs> Jeremiah contends with Maya. Wow. Yeah, he's trying to get to Sam uh, out of the whole cycle of reincarnation, man. He's uh, contending uh, right, with right. Maya. Uh, wow. <laughs> All right. Um, this is a really long chapter, huh? Yeah, it is. This is a long book. Yeah. All right, uh, where was I? I just finished one of the... Oh, oh right, right. You bowed down like a whore, right? Yeah. Uh, yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned a degenerate and become a wild vine? Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord. You can't so, cover yeah. it up. You you can pretend yeah. to be clean all you want, but you can't cover it up. So they uh, this you reaffirms can wash for twenty seconds and and still have the coronavirus. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, the image refers to Isaiah one eighteen. If your offenses be like scarlet, like snow, they shall turn white. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the lie uh, here is netter, a sodium carbonate compound used in laundering. You know, there was that uh, musician, Blind Willie Johnson, who became blind after his mother threw lie in his face. That's terrible. Yes, it is. Jeez. Why are you telling us this? Oh, I, I don't know. I just think it's interesting. Because he, he wrote the, the song that was sent on um that uh that golden plate mm-hmm. on the, I think it was, yeah, on Voyager. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sure Landon can, I'm sure Landon knows a lot yeah. about this. <laughs> Why don't, why don't you keep reading? Yeah. 
Either way, how can you say I am not unclean? I have not gone after the balls. After the Baalim, I have not gone. Yeah, I know, but uh, let's face it, balls is better. I have not gone after the balls. That's just way better. A-A-L-S. How many sports do you have people saying that? And like foul. Ah, Uh, I have not gone after the balls. Yeah, no, that's a sports reference. Definitely. Local sport. Go local sports team. Yeah. Uh, Look. Local stadium. (laughs) Yeah, local stadium. (laughs) Look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. A restless young camel running here and there. So this is uh, maybe a reference to the Valley of Hinnom. Yeah, that's uh, Gehenna. Because that's where they did, did all the sacrifices. Yep. I said Child it before. Sacrifices. A wild donkey used, used to the wilderness. In, in her heat, sniffing the wind. Who can restrain her lust? None who seek her need weary themselves. In her mouth they will find her. What? That's a very weird mm-hmm. verse. In her season, the literal sense is in her mouth. The Septuagint shows season, but it could be a translator's interpretive uh, interpretation of month. So they mean the when, okay. when yeah. it's in heat. Gotcha. That makes more sense. Keep your feet from going unshod and your throat from thirst. Good point. But you said, it is hopeless, for I have loved foreigners. And after them, I will go. Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, it's loving foreigners. foreigners. Wow. What would what would Ezra and Nehemiah say? They would throw you I out mean, of the country. Couldn't they just find a nice, good Jewish girl? And yeah. <laughs> to go with those foreigners, right? If only. <laughs> if only they could do such a thing. If only. You're... As a your poor grandmother. <laughs> yeah, apparently. As a thief is shamed when caught, so the house of Israel shall be shamed. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, and their prophets who say to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone, you gave me birth. Of so, course, these are the references to the things that they make idols out of. Yeah, although trees were it's part... Yeah, uh, although trees were part of the cult of Asherah and stones are often used for making the images of sundry male gods, the line is guided by a grammatical gender. Also, uh, so that is interesting. That yeah, it's by but grammatical in, gender. in Hebrew, tree is masculine and stone is feminine. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so that that is interesting. But also, um, stones... Might also be a reference to high places because they had the the stones there. Yeah, so this is like a play on the groves and the high places because yes. you use a feminine gendered word to refer to the stones and a masculine one to refer to the groves, right? Uh, so you're using a feminine uh, word to describe these w- what would be the high places uh-huh. where masculine gods yep. might be worshipped. And a masculine word to describe the uh, the Asherah type yeah. worship, which I suppose uh, would be insulting, right? To misgender uh, <laughs> the gods of different traditions. Uh, uh, people throw a fit about their pronouns now, so you can only imagine yeah, for their gods the patron deity of a city, yeah. right? Uh, for they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they say, Arise and save us. But where are your gods that you made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you in your time of trouble. For as many as your cities are your gods, O Judah. So this is, you know, the whole the, the test thing. Like, see, mm-hmm. they can't do anything. Yeah. Uh yeah, the uselessness of uh, these yeah. idols. They are just stones and wood. Yes. Why do you contend with me? You have all transgressed against me, declares the Lord. In vain have I struck your children. They took no correction. Your own sword devoured your prophets like a ra- like a ravening lion. And the, the whole imagery of, you know, devouring by the sword has been used before. 
Of course, uh, the sword consuming your prophets. One may recall the slaughter of the prophets of Yahweh by Ahab, and the murder of prophets by paganizing monarchs probably occurred in later reigns as well. But I wanted to point out also that um, this verse that uh, you just read, mm-hmm. um, where does it start here? In verse vain 20. did I strike your sons that did not accept reproval. Right? Yeah. That goes against the wisdom tradition <laughs> of uh, both you know, the book of Proverbs and... Uh, ben Sira, because both of them are like spare the rod, spoil the child, and yeah. it appears that that approach doesn't work. Well, yeah, and of course, probably say it's it, it, it again a reference to sons and not daughters, because I guess mm-hmm. they didn't think that reproving daughters counted. Well, discipline was very important, at least yeah. for uh, yeah, for both uh. Ben Sira and Proverbs. Yeah. But we'll get to, we'll get to the female I, thing. I, I, wasn't pretty, pretty there, so. which, which book had the, the, there was a child beating thing in one of them. Yeah, yeah. Ben Sira literally had it. That, that was like, you have to beat your kids. Oh, that was that. Okay. Yeah. But this is <coughs> like directly contradictory to it, right? Because these people are like the kids of Yahweh, right? And his attempts to reprove them. Oh, and it didn't, it didn't work. It doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. So if it doesn't even work when he does it, <laughs> and you'd figure that if God's yeah. going to do something, it's going to yeah. work. I mean, th- this is in a different way than, you know, Ben Sierra suggests, but right. still, like, you'd think God would know how to make that work. Yeah, okay. no. Apparently he didn't spank hard enough. Wow, it's let's gonna, stop yeah, talking about God spanking. <laughs> I, I will point out, you talk about the sons. We'll, we'll get to the daughter stuff in 32, so... Ah, fine. Too, so. All right. Uh, and you, O oh generation, behold! 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 The word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of thick darkness? Why then do my people say, we are free, we will come no more to you? Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. So what ornaments are those? Uh, well, I'm guessing ornaments the, of the silver or stuff. gold and clearly a source of pride. A fine description of bridal ornamentation takes place in Ezekiel 16, 10 to oh, 13. Yes, I remember that. And the parallel is the bride cannot forget her uh, kisharet. Um, the word is of uncertain meaning since it appears only here and in the list of finery in Isaiah 3.20. The verb kishor uh, means blind and therefore it has been suggested that the word means breastband, stomacher. And this is as good a guess as any. <laughs> I remember there was a, it may have been, yeah, I think this may have been in Proverbs, but there was like a whole list of uh, like jewelry. Mm, Well, that was a song of Psalms, uh, song of Psalms. (laughs) Yeah. No, song of Solomon has a lot of the ornamentation. Yes. Yes. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. Which is fitting because of the context. Yeah. How well you direct your course to seek love so that even to wicked women you have taught your ways. Also, on your skirts is found the lifeblood of the guiltless poor. You did not find them breaking in. Yet in spite of all these, you say, I am innocent. Surely his anger has turned from me. So the lifeblood of the innocent poor. Remarkably. This is the very first reference in the book to a sign of perpetrate a sin of uh, perpetrating injustice rather than a cultic trespass. Uh, for a hideout, this is a tunnel dug in order to break into a house. So, oh, all right. Uh, but Intense. upon all these, so it says, not in a hideout did I find them, but in a but upon all these, uh, the reference is a little obscure. Perhaps the meaning is all of these skirts, which would be splattered with the blood of the innocent. So, 
Behold. 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 I will bring you to judgment for saying, I have not sinned. How much you go about changing your way. You shall be put to shame in Egypt as you were put to shame in Assyria. From it too, you will come away with your hands on your head. For the Lord has rejected those in whom you trust and you will not prosper by them. Is that like a prisoner thing? Um, so it says, for from this, you shall come out. Uh, or is in, it, or is in it like light a of the immediately preceding line, this would have to be Egypt. Uh, with your hands upon your head. This is a gesture of despair or mourning. So like, mm. you know, the, like weeping angel type thing. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the end of the chapter. Hey, if you're enjoying the stream so far, give us a like, subscribe, comment, check out our 666 donation drive. If you yes, here's here's a ball. Which where yeah. are we on the 666 donation let drive? Let me let me check here quick. Uh We are at Around 170. Yep. And once we hit $666, we will be getting a Thetan meter. We'll be seeing who the most clear is. We'll be taking it apart. We'll be manipulating it. We'll be telling you all about Scientology. And we'll send you on your merry way. <laughs> you, should, you should definitely do a, a poll before you do that as to who is the clearest. Ah. And, and maybe offer a, a prize to the, you know, the person who predicts. I don't know, is there a, is like a meter reading or something like that? Well, yeah, it would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, so it would be it, percentage it's, wise. It's like you grab a thing and it tells you how clear you are. I don't know. We could uh, see. We don't have a Discord, but if we did, we could have Discord flare for it or something. I don't know. <laughs> like, no. there you go for the for the clear one. <laughs> yeah, precognitive members of our community here. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe you could you know have people pick who is going to be the most clearest and pick a random you know person from that from from the winner to receive something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, sure, yeah, we can hop into this uh, this next and final chapter for the day. Yeah, well, chapter three. I'll give you that. Yeah, quite a, quite I'll a long episode, but that's okay. Alters okay. commentary. You can work through that, yeah. and we're not referencing this here. Yeah, uh, because this chapter is like mixed in with other yeah, ones, yeah. and it's not, of course, a lot of information either. So I'm just closing that. Okay. There's a bookmark in there. I'm just flipping it up. All righty. So we're going to get into chapter three, which is uh, free to roam the faithless Israel and treacherous Judah and all that good stuff. Yeah, this is the the so, continuation okay. of the the metaphor. Yeah, and I want to point out yeah, before yeah. you start reading it that um, a lot of this is like in prose form, whereas prior this was all poetry, um, except for like the introductory parts that are like these are the words of so and so. You know, um, so yeah, there's gonna be a lot of pros that you get into here. Yeah. Exciting. All right. Chapter three. God says, if a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? Will he, will not that land be completely polluted? But you are the harlot with many lovers. You turn to me declares the lord so sexist verse. yeah yeah, it is. yeah <laughs> the uh the relevant factor here in terms of uh the law is that deuteronomy 24 1 through 4 says that a man is not permitted to remarry his divorced wife yeah and there's a uh, there's actually a little bit more on uh on the word divorce here. So in the first colon of the verb, payel does not quite mean divorce, but it implies it by reference to the phraseology of the Deuteronomic law, which says if he writes her a bill of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out, that's payel, sends her out uh, it of means his send house. away. Yeah. yeah. There we go. But it means divorce. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So verse two, lift up your eyes. 
to the bare heights and see where have you not been violated by the roads you have set for them like an Arab in a desert and you have polluted a land with your harlotry and with your wickedness. So where have they not lain with you? The passive Hebrew verb in the consonantal text, shugalt, is evidently a rude term. Euphemistically corrected in the Masoretic marginal Let's, let's be fair here. This is all pretty rude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is correct in, uh, corrected in the Masoretic marginal note to the verb. That means to lie. Uh, Londonborm gets the flavor of the rudeness by translating the phrase as where you have, n- where have you not been laid? But the expression sounds too colloquially modern. Um, but that is the implication here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and again, uh, um, that, that, that phrase of like an Arab in the desert, is that a correct translation or has that been uh, sort of, uh, modernized yeah so the arab is perhaps imagined sitting in his tent waiting for passing caravans in order to conduct commerce others see a reference to arab marauders waiting to attack travelers so uh let's see on the paths you have sat for them is there an ironic echo here of uh sit for stay at home for in a uh, hosea 3 3 one has the impression that the hosea passage implies that gomer must uh, sit rather than lie with Hosea. Here, by contrast, Israel is depicted as sitting, waiting for uh, partners to lie with. The okay, well, so this, this is, is the word kind that, of like this is the uh, word that's translated. We... This is the word that's translated as Arab uh, has con- uh, pa- has caused difficulty uh, since both the Arab uh, and the crow, and that that's in um, so so we have Arab being in the plural in the Masoretic uh, and in the Targum and then the Peshitta and the Septuagint have crow are associated with the desert and with pillaging or scavenging. Yeah, so we can, we can also bring up um, in Jubilees, which we were just reading, uh, Tamar sits at the side of the road and because of that, it was Judah, right? Judah, yeah, yeah. Judah interprets her as being a prostitute. Um and this is kind of what's being brought up here, right? They're pointing out that uh, the people of Israel have been whoring after other mm, gods. Interesting. And it says you're sitting on the road uh, like the Arab in the desert, uh, and you pollute the land through your whoring and through your evil. Good so point. this is like a, a prostitution image. Good point, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Okay. So, verse 3. Therefore, the showers have been withheld. And there, is, there has been no spring rain. You had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. So uh, the, the harlot's forehead, I remember there was a, a thing about the forehead, right? When we were talking about... Uh, like there a was A poor woman's ago. brow. I, I remember there was a, a whole thing about uh, marking the... Uh, I forget which book this is in, but marking the uh, like the sinners and whatnot. Like I remember that somewhere. Well, we could also imagine. I don't know where I remember it like, from. Like uh, a uh, pageantry, right? Like she's beautifying herself, a whore woman's brow and altar. Right? So the so a, a whore's forehead. Yeah, the the forehead is the seat of obsistency. So it's Isaiah forty eight four. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, and Israel is offering Yahweh a whore's forehead, <laughs> though the expression is usually taken simply as an expression synonymous with that of the last colon. It is possible that it refers to some kind of phylactery worn by a prostitute. Herodotus mentions that Babylonian women resorting to cult prostitution sit with a crown of of cord around the head. Yeah, and there are, are is you some familiar with from that, the that kind of image of like the the strings that and they've got like a yes. jewel or something in the middle. Yes. And, yeah. So maybe that's what they're talking about. Maybe. Yeah, that's a that's a interesting one. Okay. So verse four. Have you not just now called to me? 
my father, thou art the friend of my youth? Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Behold. 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 By the way, I hope the chat has been doing the behold stuff on there. Uh, oh, they haven't. But, but they should uh, be. Nobody has. Yeah, rabble, rabble, okay. rabble. Let's, let's get to behold. <laughs> yeah. um, you have spoken and you have done evil things and you have had your way. Hmm, what way did they have? Hmm. Yeah, this is Aren't translated as look, you spoke and did evil things and will you prevail? So. A little the answer is no. <laughs> it's of a, course not. It's a rhetorical question. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna fail. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I hope people have been keeping the behold count because we've definitely had a pile of behold. Few, yeah. Uh, I haven't, but it's like five. I think I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. It's five. All right. Then the Lord said to me in the days of Jehaziah the king, "Have you seen what?" faithless Israel did she went up on every high hill and under every green tree and she was the harlot there yeah so back wow. to that imagery yeah it oh. goes on every high mountain and every lush tree and plays the whore there yep so this is still mm. referencing the uh the groves and the high places yeah 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 and I thought after she has done all these things she'll return to me but she did not return. Her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Mm. And I saw that for all the adulterous, faithless Israel, I sent her away, given her writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear. She went and was the harlot also. Ah! Ah! Mm. Uh. Mm. Oof, mm, disgusting. Mm, 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 mm. What a pair of sisters. So <laughs> it came about of the lightness of her highlight tree that she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yeah, so <laughs> and, and it happened that from all her whoring, the land was polluted and she committed adultery with stone and tree. Uh, for all from all her whoring, the received text seems to say from the voice of her whoring, Mikol Zenuta. Many scholars amend this to Mikol Zenuta, claiming it means from her casual or easy whoring. But call is an adjective that does not make syntactical sense as a construct form with Zenuta. This translation instead reads Mikol Zenuta from all her whoring. So... There is some difficulty with this, but it means what you think it means. <laughs> no. So verse 10. And yet, in spite of all her treacherous sister Judah, did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. Moving on yeah. to verse 11. Unless you want to have a commentary on that, because we're going to go to a new, uh, there's a new chapter or a new, a new paragraph here. Yeah, I mean, I got uh, nothing to add. No. All right. And the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim the words towards the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger. For I am gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Yeah, so the likely location is not the kingdom of Israel, calling out the words to the north. Long destroyed, and its population largely replaced by people brought in from elsewhere in the mm -hmm. Assyrian sphere. But the northern reaches of the Assyrian empire, to which the inhabitants of Israel have been exiled. This prophecy, enunciated a century after the destruction of the northern kingdom, surely expresses what is no more than a utopian hope. For by Jeremiah's time, the exiles would have been assimilated into the surrounding peoples and would have lost their national identity. Yeah. Okay. That's, uh, so, that works. So, so I go on to saying, only acknowledge your iniquity. 
that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, and you have scattered your favors to the strangers under every given green tree. You have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Yeah, of course, uh, strangers there being foreigners. Foreign gods. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, foreigners are there. A return, O faithless Israel, declares the Lord, for I am master to you, and I will take you from a city and two from a family. So one I from a town. To oh, yeah. um, one from a town and two from a clan. This looks like a version of the notion of the saving remnant articulated by Isaiah. Only a small minority will be saved and brought back to Zion. That is what it mm, intends. Yeah. Is that, yeah, I will take one from a city and two from a family and bring you to Zion. Or bring you to salvation or something. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart whom will feed you on the knowledge and understanding. I'm so supposing these are the teachers. teachers. Knowledge yeah. and understanding. Because I thought knowledge and understanding are, are, are bad things. Right. But the uh, the shepherds here, the as before in the book of Jeremiah, are rulers of the people. Yeah. So, uh, oh. yeah, the people are sheep. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. And it shall be in those days when you have multiplied and increased in the land, declares the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, it shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they miss it, nor shall it be made again. So huh. the ark narrative in 1 Samuel 5 through 7 suggests that a fetishistic conception of the ark as a magical object had currency among the people. Well, I mean, yeah, that was the whole uh, thing, you know, when, when it was in another city, it would like... But it did destroy the others. And uh, it always statues. had magic powers. Yeah. I mean, like back to Korah and Dathan, right? Like people even among Moses were being punished yeah. for misusing the Ark of the Covenant. But um, here it says that the original Ark had been removed from the temple and lost, which one may infer from some biblical te texts, but not from others, right? So I think we brought up before yeah, that I, once all of the gold had been destroyed in the temple, yeah. that would include the Ark of the Covenant. Yep. Yeah. Now, here is further confirmation. It's gone. Yeah. The Ark of the Covenant has been destroyed. No Indiana Jones stuff is happening here. Yeah. Yeah. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all the nations shall be gathered to it for the name of the Lord in Jerusalem, nor shall they walk any more after the stubbornness of their evil hearts. In so interesting that now uh, yeah, that's the, the throne of the Lord. Right, because previously the Ark of the Covenant, yeah. had, so they followed up with, well, we no longer need the Ark of the Covenant, basically, right? Because now this is going to be the new throne. Yeah. Of course, now they don't have a statue to put on it. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so in those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel. They shall come together from the land of the north and the land that I gave your fathers as an inheritance. Then I said, how will I set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land? for the most beautiful inheritance of the nations. And I said, you shall call me my father and not turn away from me. Yeah, better not turn away. You saw what happened to all those other guys. Yeah, and you know, this kind of language about uh, God as a father, yeah. it, it starts really in Isaiah. And it's continuing here in Jeremiah. But it definitely is not well, something that's I, original to the New Testament. I, I wouldn't say, well, yeah, like the, the New Testament wouldn't be like, a, it wouldn't just introduce this whole father thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, it's I think it started earlier. Did it start early? There may have been like one or two references, but they've really been hammering it in. And yeah, here yeah. they've yeah. said it like multiple times in one chapter. Yeah. Um, so, but it's still not like the 
father of Jesus kind of father. Well, not right? at this point. This is the progenitor yeah. of yeah. life kind of father, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's in, you sure. know, my, my holy father. Yeah. Yeah. So in verse 20, it says, Surely a woman treacherously departs from her lover. So you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. You know, here's actually something interesting about the whole father thing. Um, so the image of God as father is, of course, very old in the Near East, uh, antedating Yahwism. Mm-hmm. There are Mesopotamian names compounded with father. For example, Shamash Abi, uh, Shamash is my father. Uh, and in the Ugaritic text, Danel calls El his father. Similarly, in Similar to the Old Testament theophoric names compounded uh, with father are common in all periods, but texts are, uh, yeah, but texts are loath to call Yahweh father, doubtless because of the prevalence of such imagery in Canaanite religious diction. In Exodus 4.22, however, Yahweh calls Israel his firstborn son, and in Deuteronomy 32.6, we read, Is not he your father? who created you closer to Jeremiah's time is Isaiah one, two sons have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. So like the God is a father thing, like as part of names, um, that might be more common than people thought, right? You, because we have a number of stories about demigods, right? And these demigods always are introduced not always, but almost always introduced in the same way that uh, they their mother was just prancing around and then suddenly uh, got magically pregnant or something and they say that the father is from Zeus. Uh, you know, th- a magic this is a baby. child from uh, Apollo. I mean, yeah, definitely close is, to that. Yeah. Um, so it, it's something like that. That's the kind of image. But really, here... I think the point of this verse is to like really compound the idea of the narrative. Now, prior they had been going on with all of this imagery about the whoring woman, but here they directly say, as a woman betrays her companions, mm-hmm. you have betrayed me, O house of Israel. Right. So they're taking the metaphor that they had previously written about through the entire book and now stating it outright. Yeah. So it's like a culmination. Yeah. Okay, so uh, verse 21 starts the final uh, paragraph of uh, Jeremiah chapter 3. A voice is heard on the bare heights, the weeping and supplication of the sons of Israel, because they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, O faithless son, I will heal your faithlessness. Behold! Behold! Behold. We will come to thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Surely the hills are a deception, the tumult on the mountain. Surely the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. So now these uh, the these hills, you know, the high places are being rejected. Ah, about time. Yeah, those worries and whoring that had been brought up previously are now being abandoned. So there's like a resolution. Finally. Finally. Yeah. So verse 24. But the shameful thing has consumed our labor for our fathers since our youth, their flocks and their herds and their sons and their daughters. Let us lie down in our shame. Let us let our humiliation cover us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, and we have and our of our fathers since our youth, even to this day, and we have not obeyed the voice of Lord our God. So this shameful thing uh, at the beginning of this verse here, uh, the shameful thing, the noun boshet, shame or shameful thing is regularly used as a pejorative substitution for Baal. One sees this in theophoric names, where the Baal suffix has been editorial ch- editorially changed to Boshet, as in Mephibosheth, originally Mephibaal, 
yeah, so there there is quite a lot here uh on that. So there is a uh, Ishbosheth, mm. Eshbal, uh and yeah, as you said, uh Mephibosheth and Meribal. Uh but the view since the 19th century that these proper names were simply censored by those who wanted to avoid the use of the term ball may be too simple. Uh, Matathaitu Savat has suggested that Bosheth may be a divine name in its own right, Akkadian Bashtu, a uh, pride guardian angel. In any event, there is no doubt that Bosheth and Ball are associated, given the tradition of double names in Saul's household and in the direction of of Hosea 9.10 and the very uh, use of the phrase in the passage is indication that Jeremiah saw in the association one more way to mock Baal worship since the word appears in verse 25 and its ordinary meaning of shame. All right. Well, with that being said, that's all the readings that we're doing yeah, today. Yeah, it is. Oh, boy. Yeah, slightly long. Um, we did have to go through that introduction, yeah. but you know, I hope that you all enjoyed the viewing today. Landon, do you have anything that you want to show to the audience? Any, you know, you're writing a book or something? Well, I mean, first of all, you talk about shame. Um, one of the shames I have is of the network, which is performing now. Uh, last night, in fact, we did a tuning of the network, and uh, one my shame is that I put down on the transmitter over there a essentially a middle chair which act effectively as a faraday cage <laughs> and and block uh, the signal so i had a really <laughs> poor uh, which now it's working just fine so well, that's that interesting my, uh, network shame uh to, to you the jeremiah versus three you have you have put a faraday cage on my signal and <laughs> your network <laughs> only landon um, only landon <laughs> uh, i also want to declare that i am now um homeownerlessness and i'm also jobless right i'm 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 uh i have retired i'll say from 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 uh cisco and um if they only turn on and pay me they haven't paid my final paycheck but that's another story um mm -hmm. uh but but i'm looking forward this month to focusing uh, really on 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 family did things and trying to get paid and trying to uh, get my uh, 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 medical uh, uh, insurance uh, going forward because you know um, in this country the US um, we we don't recognize healthcare as a right yeah. but <laughs> you know I'm I am I I am looking forward to uh, come January my full-time focus is going to be considering and evaluating projects of interest. And I'm going to proceed with working full time on those selected projects. So things are coming forward. Uh, stay tuned. Groovy. And again, please, please uh, subscribe, like, uh, share it with your landlords. Yeah. Uh, share it socially responsibly, right? You can with be, your with you your ex-wife. Right. Yeah. Write the uh, the URL to our broadcast on that monolith. Oh yeah. Go out there and write it down. Just yeah. spray paint it or something. Yes, 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 and and maybe someday uh, you know, they have they have a store where you can get things. Maybe maybe what you can do is to to uh, get a, a mask with a behold on front. That would be, that be nice. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. idea. Is Teespring making masks? Would, they should. Maybe. They should. I'll check. But without further ado, I think that's all we have. Well, to we got some shilling. Say. We do have some shilling to do, so check us out on Patreon. Landon's one of our patrons, and for that reason, he gets yeah. onto our show once a month. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Uh, you could also get entered into the t-shirt giveaway. Which we did at the beginning of the show. We did, and Landon of course won that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can uh, see all of our video scripts. Yeah, you can for, also... For, that's for a dollar a month. Some, so that's pretty You good. can get our self-published books. You can get invited to live events if we hold any live events. It would be in the future, obviously. Uh, yeah, we also have Teespring, which we've brought up before. Yeah, um, and Facebook and Twitter. Those are free to follow you us get on there. T-shirts like this. Yeah. Yes. You yes, you can. Like and of course, they they have a reading list. And if you want to invest in your own enjoyment of the commentary. There are books on there with, in priority order that you can uh, order for them. And guess what? They'll show up on that table and be used in sessions like this or in creating these wonderful scholarly videos. 
That's exactly what they will be used for. Yes. And, you know, you'll be able to show your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. And because no one will let ex- you die. You know, <laughs> we didn't mention that part. Medical science, man. It's going to be it's gonna be rough for you for the next 200 years. But <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyways, uh, uh, I think that's that's about it. Yeah, just make sure you drop a like. Cause, or a dislike, I don't really care. Just interact in some way because it really does help out. Uh, yep. Yeah, I think that's... Uh, I see 16 con- concurrent viewers. I should see 16 likes and dislikes. Yeah. Concurrently. Uh, all, all, all in total. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, I think that's... Uh, I think that's all the show. Yeah, that's about it. Okay, yeah. I guess we all will right. we see, see you on Friday. Friday. Also Sunday. And then, uh, uh, you know, every, every, every day. Every day. Watch us. Every